to try and help solve any overcrowding that they can. We've seen an increase in traffic and safety concerns. So imagine the same traffic and parking situations that you all face every day, and then double the number of parents and buses that are required to service that school and service the community. And last but not least, the way that a lot of communities have, have tried to fund that what we're, calling, what we're identifying as a $91.5 million um, deficit is to tax additionally, uh, tax the, the existing community with additional tax dollars. And so they look to the existing community, not the new community alone, to help supplement the funding shortfall. So again, you know, these are not solutions that we have identified or determined are viable options for Santa Rita, but this is how this development could or will impact the existing community, its educational programs, as well as the existing facilities. So we'll go ahead and we'll take questions. Do we have some microphones available? So if you can get some volunteers come out and just grab a couple of microphones and turn them on. If, if there's anybody out here has a question, just raise your hand and we'll bring a microphone to you. I know there's questions out there. Okay, we have one right here and then we have one over there. So let's go ahead and get a microphone right here. And then we'll get back to Yes, I thank you for doing this today for us. My name is Sapo Trace, I'm a teacher at McKinnon. My question is, is there a way we could postpone this construction since we don't have, or is it for sure sure we're gonna have this construction this year or next year? So ultimately the approval of the project rests with the, the city and, and the city council. Um, on June 6th, there is a, uh, a meeting for the Planning Commission to vote and recommend the project to the City Council. And then on June 16th is when the City Council will hold a, their regular set of meeting and they alone will vote to approve or deny the, the, the project moving forward. And I'll just, I, I just want to mention that there is a housing crisis in the Salinas area. Uh, this, is an, this is a problem that we're facing as a city, and while my job is to focus on the Santa Rita Union School District, I have to recognize that there's a bigger issue because we are a member, a community member of the Salinas City. And so there is a housing crisis. These houses, we need to, you know, we're going to need to build houses. Now, how that looks and, and what the rollout time is and how fast it's going to happen, that's all things that we really don't have an answer for at this time. But I would expect, given you know what I've learned over the last two and a half years, that we're probably looking at the first houses starting to break ground probably summer of 2020, something like that. But I don't know that for certain. I'm just saying I think that's probably the timeline that's realistic. And then how fast it rolls out after that, it just depends on, depends on weather, it depends on the economy. It depends on the but this this has this this development has to occur. We accept that. We know that it's just all the all the details. We're trying to work uh, in partnership with uh, the developers who we have been in contact with, and we're negotiating different options and solutions to try to fund these. And they're being very cooperative and coming to the table. And um, I, I think we we've got a good start. It's just it's going to take a lot of work. So. about the estimate, the total estimate for students coming, because I noticed in your citations you said it's from this estimate from the source plan itself and then from rough estimates of our district, but I'm kind of curious where that only 2,000 students from 4,000 homes kind of stems from. Thank you. Yeah, and that's a great question and, and something we spend getting in the weeds every day on. So I wanted to spare all you all the details a little bit, but 
what we are able to do is we're able to analyze the number of students that are produced from each type of home a few different ways. The first is, is we're able to go look at the number of kids that have been produced in the last five years from residential units that are newly constructed. And so that's one way, to look at the more recent trend in terms of the number of kids that are coming from the, the type of unit that is apparently being constructed and the market is demanding. The second way is to look at the housing stock, or every single home within the Santa Rita School District boundaries, and then just determine what our enrollment is, so we can see how many kids that housing population, or that housing stock produces. And so we apply that ratio to the homes that are going to be built in the future. And so that's how we get the range. Just, One follow-up, go ahead. Sorry. Um, so Statistic for people per unit, is that for all of California, all of the United States, or for Salinas, or for our area specifically? So it's specific just to the Santa Rita School District. Question right here. So, uh, Robin Lee? <laughs> Uh, is there a current need for another elementary school currently? Are, are the schools here existing? Are they bursting at the seams that you kind of need a school relatively soon in the future before uh, and very much the build out happens? So, two parts. First, do, do we have room for existing facilities to grow some before we have to? The answer is yes. Uh, this site in particular has some room still to grow. We also accept the fact that we're going to have to have a transition plan in place. We're going to have to add some rooms to existing facilities while these homes are built because we couldn't, we couldn't afford to run a school until there's probably 300 to 400 students because you have to staff it with teachers, you have to staff it with principals, you have to do, you have to have, you have to take care of the facilities, you have to hire maintenance and grants. So to get a school district up to the size where it would where it would support a staff we'd have to wait until we have probably 300 to 400 students. That's going to take a little while. So the, the second answer is we have to have a transition plan in place on our existing facilities to accommodate the growth until such time as the growth gets to a point where it will sustain a school. So the current schools aren't bursting at the seams. There is some room to grow. We or have there's... some that are bursting at the seams, but we have some that still have some room, but not a lot. And this is one of them that has some room, and we this would be an area where, since where it's located, would be the first place where we look for that first set of growth. But we're going to have to put some kind of transition facility plan in place over the next year, so we're ready to go as soon as they start to break down. Yeah, go ahead. And then... <laughs> And as I mentioned in that last slide, what we're seeing in the state of California is school districts that don't have adequate school facility funding, um, whether that be from the developer or the state or, or a combination of both, end up replacing any specialized or any educational programs to accommodate the core educational programs. And so you end up replacing anything that makes Henry special with just room to accommodate kids. Hi, my name is Lupe and I'm a homeowner close by. And my question is, uh, is that your home projects are going to be low income? Yeah, and so I believe in the, in the environmental impact report and from what we've heard at City Council study sessions is that there are affordable housing components identified in the environmental impact report to the extent how many units in the price point, I'm unaware of that. But I know there's a portion of the project from our, um, from the information that we refused from city council is made up of the housing. Juanita, would you take her Hi, my name is Irma Guzman and I'm a parent and homeowner also. And I'm wondering what the tax burden is it going to make my property taxes go up because they're already almost 6000 a year. And so I agree that we do need more schools and teachers but and more housing, sure. 
but I don't want that to make my property taxes go up because I'm also a single parent. Yeah, and, and I think at this point, um, the district has not made any determination as to move forward any kind of funding mechanism that would require a vote of the community to raise property taxes. Um, in order to do so, the school district would have to have the community vote on it. Um, unfortunately, though, that is typically a, an option that districts take when, when the funding isn't locally sourced. And so they're put in a position where they have to go to the existing community because the schools are failing in order to ask the, the community to pay for the improvements that need to be made. Let me just add that we just went through a refinance, so actually I'm happy to tell you you're going to see a reduction in that 6000 We just went through a refinancing on the existing bonds from 2006 because we're, we're concerned about the existing tax base being taxed you know, additionally, but that conversation has not taken place yet. It's so far down. If you're talking about going out for another bond on the existing homeowners, we haven't even discussed that yet. So is that is it a possibility down the road? We don't know yet, but it's it would be one of the last things that we we would do. Okay. And that's the best I can do. I can't promise you that we're never gonna but you know the good news is like Corey said, it goes to a vote of the people and you need to decide. So we need question any question there? Hi, I'm Diana Burton Smith. I'm a homeowner in this area and I've worked in this district forever. My question is regarding the housing project, how is the housing project and the traffic and change to Rhonda Road going to work together, together and coincide? If it all happens at once, we're never going to be able to get into school. Yeah. So, um, I can't get out to the neighborhood now. So, um, the school district and, and I recommend everyone going to the city website where I think you can get comment of the comments the school district made to the environmental impact report that was that was up for public review. Um, as far as the traffic concerning, we only have looked at it from the perspective of the school district. But what isn't taken into consideration in the environmental impact report, and just key, is that the environmental impact report assumes that we would build two elementary schools and a middle school at the sites identified in the plan. We recognize today that's not going to be the case, and we will not be able to afford to do so. So what is not addressed is the traffic concerns that would be created at the existing sites um, due to the, the necessity of hosting all the additional growth students at our, at our current facilities. And as far as traffic, that, you know, we can talk about traffic around the schools, but I, I wouldn't venture to, to speak for traffic in the city of Salinas. That's not appropriate for me to do at this time. But I, I can tell you what Corey's talking about is we're aware of the traffic around our school sites, and, uh, and we're committed to doing what we can. But we're going to look for local solutions first, uh, you know, to try to figure out how we can accommodate and maybe stagger times or something like that to alleviate that. We don't know yet. We're in the beginning stages of this. Uh, but we understand and we agree that traffic is an issue around our schools, especially this one uh, and, and, and some of them, all of them, but this one in particular. So. Good morning, afternoon, whatever day it is. <laughs> My name is Brenda. I teach middle school. Um, how will the district make sure that the school sites are properly sized by the developer, i.e. McKinnon School, McKinnon Park? I see the little quadrilateral of some sort on here, and so I just want to make sure that you don't get shortchanged like you did before. That's, that's, a, that's a good question. Um, we have to learn, uh, you know, how to talk to each other. Just like we've done internally this year. I have to learn how to be better at speaking to the developers, to the city. You know, we have to learn to be able to dialogue because then we can start to come up with common solutions for common problems. Because, quite frankly, I haven't done that great a job of that yet. So I understand what you're saying, and I agree with you. Uh, 
but there's no black hats and white hats in this deal. There's, these people are good people. We have different interests, but we're going to see if we can't find common interests. And if we can, I think then we can find common solutions. So I just wanted to really reiterate that we are in a huge housing crisis in the city of Salinas. And a lot of these people that will be moving in here, they're not coming here new. They're people that are living in homes with three and four families that will be able to afford to buy in this neighborhood. So we need to keep that in mind. We may not be adding as many new people as you guys are anticipating that we will add. I appreciate the dialogue and, and us starting this conversation. There's lots of things that could happen here. Um, one of the issues with what you just brought up with um, having a big enough school is a developer is only required to have a certain amount of open space in their project. And trying to fit that in what seems like a large area to you, a very small area for, for this amount of housing, and you know, perhaps the school will allow us to use their green space as part of our park space in non-school hours, and that helps mediate bigger school environment and also having that open space that's required for any project. So there's lots of conversations that can happen here, and you know, we're we're at the beginning, but everybody needs to remember that this was actually put in the general plan 20 years ago. We are 20 years down the road on this project, and, and it's time to get it started. By not starting it, we have created the issue of shortage on housing and people living in garages, and you know that that's our fault for not pushing this along further. Sorry. Uh, so I, you know, I just want to let everybody know that. You know, it's a good project, uh, good developers, they live in the community, they care about this community, and I, I think working together we should be able to move this forward. Thank you. Hi, Mr. Ryan. I'm Tricia Hill from New Republic. I teach kinder at New Republic. And let me just start by saying thank you so much for having this informational meeting. Um, my question is in regard to the transition period. I'm wondering if you guys are considering any schedule changes such as maybe um, going back to half-day kinder so we could do two full kinder classes or like a year-round school program. Is there any talk of that to accommodate those the additional students? We have not had any conversations specifically <coughs> about that. What I'm saying is this summer is going to be busy for us as we start to just map out options and then we'll come back with the board in the fall and we'll, we'll reach out to the staff like we've done in the spring. Uh, Ms. Alderman and I and uh, in the board and the other cabinet and the principals and teachers and class, we're all going to get together, we're going to talk about this and try to come up with some solutions internally. We have, we have to start becoming proactive and so there's been no specific scheduling or kindergarten year-round school or any of that stuff. Although, all of those things, there are districts that are doing, those are solutions that are happening around the state, so sure. Thank you. But not here yet. Hello, I'm George Huckle. I'm a retired teacher from the school district. I uh, live right down the street here, and actually I taught here at McKinnon. But for many years, I was a negotiator for the teachers, and she's correct when she says we were dealing with this about 20 to 25 years ago. We knew this was going to happen, but the economy turned south, and everything just kind of stopped and was put on hold. As a matter of fact, this school isn't supposed to be here. It's supposed to be down at the park down there. Uh, but uh, the way it worked out, funding and everything else, it ended up at this spot right here. Uh, so I want you to be aware that this is something that's been going on for a long time. It's probably about time that it really gets going. The other question I had actually is, I was at a meeting here about a year, year and a half ago, I can't remember now, about roundabouts that we're going to put over here. Uh, I just wondered if that is still in consideration or what the status is. I haven't heard anything about that for a long time now. 
I've been to a meeting with the city where I saw those plans, but I think I would refer you back to the city manager for that. I don't want to make comments on the status of that, but I have seen plans for the roundabouts on Verando, uh, so, but I would refer you back to the city manager's office for that. Okay. I'm not dodging your question, I'm just being careful. I don't want to answer for the city uh, where it's not appropriate. So, is there questions? Up right here. So after we, okay, this lady hasn't asked a question yet, and then we'll get to one. So go ahead, yes. Hi, my name is Marisa Lalcon. I'm I work for the district. Um, because of the development um, that's being projected in this area, what's going to happen with all the agricultural fields and um, the people who? Quote unquote, are supposed to be affording these this house because there's going to be affordable housing, maybe potentially out of a job and then not afford the houses that they were intended for them. How do you, I mean, what's going to happen with, with the people who? Well, fortunately, for those workers, we live in one of the largest agricultural areas in the country. And, uh, I don't think there will ever be a shortage of, of work, <clears throat> but as far as those specific farms, those specific pieces of ground, I wouldn't be able to venture a guess on them. The homes are going to be there, they're not going to work there obviously, but I, but I see your problem. Your, your question is a little blood deeper than what, you know, it may seem like I, I understand what you're saying. And, you know, progress sometimes is painful, you know, on the micro level, but on the macro level, it's, you know, it's one of those things that as, as communities grow, as cities grow, these things are, are pretty much inevitable and we just have to make adjustments and, and, and accommodate the growth as best we can and help those people as best we can. All I know is when their students show up, we're going to teach them. That's what I can guarantee. Anybody else? I don't have a question, but I want to introduce myself as a worker. I, I'm school secretary here at McKinnon. And I just want to say in the last month, in my 20 years I've been working for the district, I've never seen 15 students in one month for this school year. And this was last month. So I, as an office personnel, I see the great need that we need of housing. And I am that way support because I see families coming and telling me they don't have a place to live. They don't, they're living in rooms. So I just want uh, everyone to see that side, that it, it is a crisis. And we need to see it in the, that positive way. Thank you. I think if anybody could see it, it's enrollment. It's the, it's the, the secretaries and the clerks. They're going to know exactly how many students they have coming in that do not have homes to live in. And it is, it is, a, it is it's a critical issue to see. I mean, that's, you can drive down the streets and see it. Okay. Uh, yes, follow up right here. So you're talking about staggered um, openings for schools, like Rogi Road, for instance, has an elementary school, and a middle school, and a high school that's going to open. Yep. So how the heck are all these teachers, and students, and faculty supposed to get, and then people who live there, how these? This is. I'm going to be speaking with Superintendent Burns uh, next week. Uh, on Thursday, and we're going to discuss that issue to see what we can do locally to accommodate the traffic. The good news is, for for the first year, there will only be freshmen and sophomores at that high school, so the traffic, the car traffic, won't be it'll be negligible. It's going to be mostly with buses, and they can we can make arrangements for them to exit out the other end if we can. But uh, but after the first year, then that's when the cars will start to show up, and then you know. The, Second. Now, there may be parents. I, I don't know. There's not too many high school students that want their parents driving them to school. That's just not, it's not a good look for them. So they, they're going to be riding the buses or have a friend. But it'll be in the second year where we'll start to see the increased traffic. But we're going to work with the high school district to try to make some kind of, some kind of adjustments between the two districts to try to accommodate that. And, and I have a comment about affordable housing. So I noticed there's like 1,300 units of single family housing. However, that's not affordable to the average person in Salinas. 
and the houses would be like five hundred thousand dollars. So you need more multifamily, attached housing, condos, um, that type of thing, and not. So I would half the, the number of, of uh, single-family housing and build more multifamily attached housing. We have more units because some areas are going down to R three only. They've gotten rid of single-family zoning period because of the affordability yeah. issue. So I, this is not something that you're. But it might have something to do with the number of students because then you'll have more units per lot. So you may end up with more students, but to make it affordable, you kind of have to get away from single-family housing. Sure. But that will up the number of people that you will be serving. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah, as far as the type of dwellings that go into this housing, it's really, um, that's something the school district doesn't have a lot of input on. So, I mean, I, I don't disagree with anything you just said. I just don't know. We would have to, you know, we would probably have to follow up and get some answers on that. Which, if you have any questions before you leave here tonight that we can't answer because we understand there's some things we just simply can't answer, please see one of our uh, assistants and get get your name and your email and we'll research it and we'll either get back to you or we can post it on our website by the end of the week. Okay, so something like that. Maybe I can reach out to somebody and try to find out. It's going to be things where it's going to be on us. We're going to have to figure something out and then, uh, you know, work with the developers to try to see if there's a way that we can use the new housing to generate the, the bonding instead of the existing homeowners. I mean, those are conversations that are ongoing right now. And at the same time, we need to be aware of, you know, the more bonding is placed on these homes, they become even more expensive and then the people you know, might not be able to afford it. So it, 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 it's going to be a very uh, treacherous journey, but one that we're going to start. Uh, you know, we're going to start up. We have to start. And like I said, they actually started 20 years ago. I'm late getting to the party, so. so um, I just had kind of a follow-up question about population. So I figured 20 years it takes for these houses to be built about 1,600, 2,000 students. For our current population right now, we're growing our district, it's moving. Does the district have a prediction of how many more students we're going to have in 20 years right now, or even 5 to 10? Well, I mean, other than the ones that we have from our demographers, no. But we also have the ability to start to reduce the number of inter-district transfers, uh, which is going to start taking place. That will be part of this plan that will extend our, our time out. We, we have some flexibility on our enrollment where we can do that, that will not impact the existing educational program for the students that reside in our district. That's, our, that's a, the primary commitment is to the students that currently reside within our district boundaries to, to protect and maintain the educational programs that we have for them. Uh, so as this happens, one of those things, one of the parts of that transition plan would be to roll back students from other districts who, who are coming here. So I mean, that has to, we have to do that. Sure. I see a question in the back. My name is Resident Ian. Uh, I got students at the center in the school district. So before I walk out, I want to make sure I'm, I'm a little clear on what's going on. I know this is more uh, in regards to the school district, but uh, it seems like the developers are going to walk out of this with a lot of money. The school district in the long run might walk out of it with a lot of money. And the community is going to get stuff to build in the meanwhile. Uh, that's kind of what I'm taking from it. Also, I, I'm sorry to catch uh, the email from saying, but, but I completely agree. And as these houses are going to be priced at a $150, $200 price point, 
we're still going to have people living in garages. We're still going to have people renting rooms. I mean, that's not going to change. Right? That, that's kind of what I'm taking from it. How is it still not going to be affordable? Uh, we, we see that in the arena right now, the people from the Bay are coming down like ones in the arena. That's what's going to happen here, too. I think you're exactly right. Um, when we do these type of projections, um, we are able to see trends across the state of California when it comes to price point affordability that people are moving further and further away from the large city centers, such as San Jose or San Francisco, to afford you know, their own single family detached, which is not affordable in downtown San Jose. So you can kind of see the matriculation of the population even here down in Gilroy. And it is the expectation that people would continue to come south for that affordability. Um, as far as the school district in terms of, of how they would receive funding, um, there is examples, and we can probably you know, include these for the next presentations, of what the district funds when they're in the position Santa Rita is facing is completely portable schools with blacktop that are funded on a hardship. So they will fund to the bare bones just to create a seat for that student to be educated, and that is it. So the schools will, will not look um, like anything that you're, you're typically seeing, but the price points that we have, have done here are not your Taj Mahal schools. These are just bare bones, necessity, construction costs. And unfortunately, up and down the state of California, school construction costs are just growing at, at, at a very alarming increase in rate. With respect to your comment about the, the school district making a lot of money, um, school districts are nonprofits for a reason because we have to spend upwards of 80 plus percent of our budget on people. Um, uh, the law requires that we spend 60 cents on every dollar uh, in the classroom instruction. So we can only keep a 10% reserve. Uh, we can't save money, we can't, uh, and we also have to maintain classrooms at 24 to one in our TK through three as an average. So it's, it's a misnomer that school districts make a lot of money. Um, I understand the frustration of this, but it, it, it's, uh, the one thing I do know, and Corey, uh, we know that we have to put portables or modulars on blacktop, but the one thing I know is the quality of instruction that will go into each one of those portables and those blacktops will be the same quality that exists today. I can guarantee that. It may be rough and we may, it may not be ideal, but the quality of the people that work in this district. I'll put my money on them. So my name is Chris Ware. I'm a local real estate agent here in Salinas, and um, I would really like to know the percentage of low-income uh, residences that have been built. And I see it every day, um, residents from out of town, up north, Bay Area, uh, moving to our area because of the prices there. Um, you can't even buy a home in Dole or Morgan Hill for a for reasonably uh, you know, good price. And um, once these homes are built, you got to figure they're going to be in the four or five hundred thousand dollar range. Um, if, if all you have to do is look at comps. So I think we need to be responsible in with the building and make sure that there are enough schools to withstand the new homes. You know, because at the end of the day, it's about our children. You know, there are, there are future leaders, and if you have 40 kids in one class, really what 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 one-on-one -on -one will they have with the teachers? You know, um, you, have to think, you have to keep that in mind. You know, and if we don't have enough money for enough schools, then I think we need to be responsible with the number of homes that are being built and the prices. I, I know you can't control the prices, and you can't control who, who buys these homes. But uh, I question if 
all these homes should be being built, you know, for our for our community. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to say that this is, I think that's the second question we've had on the percentage of low income. I don't have that number. I don't know it, but we're going to get it, and we will uh, we'll get that information out. Uh, tomorrow. We'll, we'll, I think what I understand is it's kind of a moving target, but we're gonna. I'm gonna check into it because I don't want to answer something based on my current information if it's not up to date. So I just want to check that first. But I, I'll, I'll look into it and see if it can. Can you reiterate uh, what June 6th is according to this? Is it a planning meeting at the planning office? You had mentioned June 6th, and then there's a June 16th approval or not approval of the project. June 6th, I, I believe, is a planning commission meeting at the city is that, office. Sorry, is that open to the public? Yes. I believe so. All right. June 6th, good one. I'm going. So. All right. Okay. Question right here. I just want to be clear. Um, you mentioned that we're in crisis at home. So is there going to be any requirements for someone that wants to Buy a, home, buy a home, such as, you know, you're going to be in Salinas, not outsiders? That's, that's not legal. <laughs> well, because we're in crisis, so that's what we're you know, no, we to know. Is and, this going to be for us? Or the that, for us? Yeah, you're right. And the comments that have been made throughout here are all legitimate. But, you know, from, from, from a school district standpoint, we teach the kids that come, and, and we really don't. I, I wouldn't know the first thing about building a house or developing real estate. I wouldn't know that. My my field is the field of the school and it's what we do with the kids once they move in. So I'm trying to be, I'm trying to answer the question, but I really don't know that there's an answer I can give. And I, I know that's probably frustrating for some people. I'm not I can't answer for the developers or for the city that and I'm not even going to guess. Right? So, my, I guess my point is, is something like the affordable housing or something, those are, that's information we can find out to get to you. But as far as market factors and, and restrictions on housing, I, I really can't comment on any of that. But I can't restrict people from buying homes. So 
I think his point was the numbers that he was showing you early is, is not an extravagant number that's based on these, you know, streets lined with gold kind of schools. They're, they're, they're like the ones that we have now. Right? We have Mazra buildings on all of our sites. We have portables on all of our sites. And, you know, it, that's just the reality in California. So, so it will be unlikely that we'll leave our one environment um, one Chromebook to one oh, 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 I see. I, I, I'm sorry. I didn't appreciate it. Uh, no, there's no, right now, there's, if the economy turns and the budget goes back like it did back in 2009, then, you know, everything's on the table then. But right now, there's no, there's no conversations about that. That money is, uh, school financing is very technical, but a lot of that funding is restricted and can't be used, uh, you know, for construction. And, and so, yeah, we would have to, we have to make sure that we take a look at that. And we know the families need it. 
And, but the question is, is how do we go about it? And that's what we're here to discuss. And that is, you know, we're going to have a shortage of funding. And here's the thing, we need the development. We are in support of the developers. We want the homes to come in. We need them. We have two to three families living in one home. You go to both of those, you go to Santa Rita, you go to North Santa Rwanda, where our families live, and you'll see it. So the truth is, we need these homes. But at the same time, we want everyone to work together to make sure that we have enough funding so we provide the, the proper education that these families deserve. And that's all we're asking for. And that uh, we need to get creative, the community, the city, the developers. We all have good hearts. We all want to do the right thing. We just need to come together and figure out the funding sources to get it done. And the truth is, regarding the market, uh, housing values of Salinas, any reverse year economist will tell you it's supply versus demand. Simple as that. For the last 20 years, we've had almost no development in Salinas. Almost none. And that's just population continues to increase. So the truth is, we need housing desperately. We need it in the west area side, we need it in the south side, we need it on the east side, we need it everywhere. The problem is, is how do we get it done properly? And that's all we're asking for, is your support in making sure this gets done correctly so everyone benefits. The residents, the students, the current property owners, the new property owners. This is a great vision. San Marino is leading the city. We are the best school, the best district. And we're, the one, we're going to be increasing our population. And we need to make sure we continue the San Diego traditions that have made us number one. And that is the class sizes, our teachers, our staff, the way we break up students from K to five and then six to eight in the middle school. Santa Rita is a unique, unique community in Salinas. Right? We have great areas that come together to provide the best education and I mean, we're going to make it better. But please, we need everyone to get involved and be aware of what is going on. Go to the meeting, go to the city, let them know what your requests are, what your thoughts are. Get involved. But once again, you are being here, I want to say thank you. for educators to get some type of deal on, the, on affordable housing? Right, local preference. For the commission and city council. Again, that's not our area of expertise. That's why it'd be a better question than them. But I think you're right. There are a lot of questions around the development, and I think that's why we're here tonight is to bring those questions. Yeah, no, and again, that's not unprecedented for school districts um, to to provide housing and teacher housing. Um, it's way more and more common at the K-12 level. We're aware of it in some remote areas. I know San Ardo has a housing area for teachers, because, but they've been there for decades because of the distance. So those remote areas are part of it. And then there are some uh, they're doing it in areas where there is higher cost of housing so that teachers can afford to live in their districts. So it, it, it's not unprecedented. But currently we have no plans for that. Cool. How are we doing? Oh, Danny. Sorry. Um, sorry. Um, so our last governor of California was a very forthcoming of funding for schools. Is there any indication besides this uh, proposition passed in November of 2016 that the current governor is more willing to give out funding to schools with, if not already, this $9 billion has already come out for one of the expires? No. <laughs> I've not seen anything out of Governor Newsom that's going to tell me he's any different than the prior governor. What I will tell you about Prop 51 is of that $9 billion, only $3 billion was set aside for new construction. $3 million, $3 billion was set aside for modernization. Uh, I believe it was $2 billion was set aside for the community colleges. 
500,000 was set aside. To, oh, I'm sorry, 500 million was set aside for career technical education, and 500 was set aside for charter school construction. That money is gone. Uh, there is no more new construction money. It's gone. Nine million dollars by itself is after a decade, over a decade of no bonds being passed at the state level, it's, it's going to take a lot more than nine million dollars. That money's gone, and so. But to answer your question about Governor Newsom, not yet. I'm still holding out hope. Yeah, and so just to follow up a little bit more, the way the, the state program used to work was you, you received, once you had all your money, you received matching funds for your school and stuff, stuff and project. Because that was when we were passing school bonds every year, every two years. Because we went 10 years without a school bond, it didn't mean we went 10 years without school facility construction projects occurring. So now the, the way the state works is they, they have a 10 year backlog, per se, of projects that are trying to catch up on the funding. So now, as a school district, you're required to have all of your funds on hand when you go to build something, and then hope, or then wait and see when the state apportions their bonds, and then you're reimbursed. Please feel free to stand around and visit and ask questions uh, afterwards. Uh, in closing, on behalf of the governing board, the staff, and students of the Santa Rita Union School District, I want to again extend our thanks to all those who took time out of their busy schedules to come out tonight and participate. I hope that tonight's meeting has answered some questions, but moreover, I hope that in the weeks, months, and years to come, it stimulates this community to ask to continue to ask questions and take an active role in this all-important marketplace of ideas. Each of you holds not only the right, but the responsibility to be informed. Tonight you've heard that there is a development of approximately 4,400 new homes that is coming to within walking distance of this very spot. For over the past two and a half years, I have attended several meetings between the district, developers, and city planners. These conversations have inevitably came down to the city's interest in addressing a housing crisis, the developer's interest in building those houses, and the school's interest in, in housing those students and educating them. Oftentimes, when there are no, so many different interests in one room, the natural inclination is for them to compete. That has certainly happened over the past two and a half years, and I must sadly admit that at times, I have been a major player in this competitive dynamic. But what I have come to see, what I have come to deeply understand, is that it is not an issue of building houses versus building schools. This is about all sides coming to the realization that we are truly building more than houses, schools, parks, but what we are building is a community. We can separate, how can we separate? homes from schools when they are woven together by the common thread of humanity, our children. Then again, how can we say to families you can't have a home when we are all comfortably ensconced in our own homes? Or how can we say to the families of our children you have to attend overcrowded schools? But when we only focus on one interest at a time, we do exactly that. We must find a way to change competing interests into completing interests. However, this will not be easy. We must dedicate ourselves to unlocking this gridlocked mindset. We do that by coming to accept that schools today are not the schools of our youth. Today, children will spend a third of their life at school. Most of our children will eat the majority of their meals at school. They will receive counseling at school. They will see health care specialists, access a variety of public services, and attend many after-school activities at our schools. Simply put, schools of the 21st century are no longer schools. They are second homes. Therefore, I submit to you that we can no longer continue to allow our different interests to become wedge issues that drive us away from finding common solutions for our children. We must challenge ourselves to rise above our parochial interests and see to the community interests. I realize this is a daunting challenge and one that may seem insurmountable at the present moment, 
But I'm going to share a quick story about a person whom I believe embodies this very spirit that will be need facing this problem moving forward. Bob Weiland was a young baseball star at the University of Wisconsin in the 1960s. He was negotiating a contract with the Philadelphia Phillies when he decided instead to enlist as an army medic and go serve in Vietnam. In 1969, while on patrol with his unit, a fellow soldier stepped on a landmine. Bob, without hesitation, rushed to his fallen comrade's side to render aid. Unfortunately, Bob stepped on a mine that was designed to take out armored vehicles. A couple of late days later, from his hospital bed, he wrote this brief note to his parents. June 14, 1969. Dear Mom and Dad, I'm in the hospital. Everything is going to be okay. The people here are taking good care of me. Love, Bob. P.S. I think I lost my legs. Now, the postscript in Bob's letter is merely a snapshot of that day in his hospital bed. But it was not the postscript for the remainder of his life. Because over the next 50 years, Bob Whelan would go on to complete the New York City Marathon in 1986 using only his hands and torso in 98 hours. He would complete the Los Angeles Marathon in 2003 in 173 hours. He would become the only double amputee to complete the Ironman Triathlon in Kona, Hawaii without a wheelchair. He was awarded the title Most Courageous Man in America by the NFL's Players Association. He amassed four world records in weightlifting, including a 570-pound bench press. People Magazine dubbed him one of the six most amazing Americans. And finally, he walked across America on his hands, covering some 2,800-plus miles, taking three years, eight months, and six days. It took an estimated five million steps. When asked what was the hardest part of this amazing task, without hesitation, Bob replied, taking that first step. Everything you accomplish in life is about taking that first step. I'm sure Bob was also thinking back to that June day in 1969 when he was faced with taking a first step out of that hospital bed. And he chose to take the first step that would lead him on an amazing 50-year journey. But Bob would put it this way when asked once by a reporter about that day. He simply said, my legs went one direction and my life went another. I think if we were to write a letter about where we find ourselves tonight, it might go something like this. May 20th, 2019. Dear Mom and Dad, a new development is coming to our district. Building 4,000 homes. Need at least three new schools for 2,000 students. P.S. We have no idea how we're going to pay for it. I know this will not be our final postscript for our future, but I wonder what our postscript will turn out to be. If we are to build the future that our children deserve, be it schools, homes, or parks, then it will take all of us to take that first step, and then maybe five million more. I ask you tonight, what will our postscript be in three years, in 10 years? in 15 years. And so, I'm giving, I'm, I'm inviting all of us gathered here tonight to take that first step together. The first step for new relationships and new community. Thank you, and God bless you, God bless Santa Rita Union School District and the City of San Thank you, good night.